Good afternoon, and thank you all for braving the uh, English September weather, so unlike the sunny skies of Baghdad, uh, to come here to listen to our star speaker, Nadim Zahawi. Now, Nadim's book is totally unlike any other political memoir you may have ever read or will ever read. Yes, it takes you into the heart of Downing Street at moments of tension, intrigue, and excitement. But it also tells the story of a young boy and his family who escaped from tyranny, and it also tells you about the immigrant experience in the 70s and 80s at a time of great change in our society, and it does so with wit and verve and humor, but also pathos as well. And this book, as well as being the story of a uh, roller coaster ride through Britain's great institutions, is also something of a love letter to Britain, written by someone who loves this country and who has served it with distinction. Nadim, uh, the book begins with your childhood in Iraq, That's right, yeah. in Saddam's Ba'athist tyranny. Mm. You tell the story of how a particular relative was only able to communicate the fact that he was being tortured in prison because the teeth that were removed by the Mukabarat were in the pockets of the trousers that he sent home to be laundered. Can you tell us what it was like as a boy growing up in an environment like that? Um, thank you, Michael, and thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction. My head will not make it through those double doors uh, <laughs> by the end of this 40-minute uh, conversation. Um, so, Iraq was a, a one-party state. Saddam had learnt his trade um, from the Stasi, and the way it operates is um, everyone in any walk of life had to belong to the party. If you're a teacher, you had to join the party. If you were um, of course, every civil servant had to be mm. in the party. Uh, when you go to school in the morning, uh, uh, as I did, uh, you get asked what you had for breakfast. Uh, but of course, that's not the question that teacher's looking uh, for an answer for. It's the next question that comes on, which is, what did you have, what conversation did you have with your parents mm. uh, in the morning? Uh, and if a child is naive enough to say, oh, well, my mum said that Saddam is a terrible human being, then that family would be marked and probably end up being brought in for interrogation. Uh, and so it really was a police uh, state. Um, from my own family's perspective, uh, the, the toughest thing to hear was that they were going to come and take my father away. Yes. Uh, and of course, I also talk about uh, my wife's family, where uh, literally um, the, the, the sort of the, the photo albums and I exaggerate to make a point, mm. uh, were, were people in those albums where uh, many of them had been tortured or um, uh, murdered by others in the picture, i.e. a society that was set against uh, one another um, through terror and absolute brutality, which we now see again you know, in North Korea and Iran mm. and elsewhere. But uh, that was the life uh, of Iraqis on the whole. Now, what tends to happen in mm. societies like that is the majority, which is why it's so hard to influence change. You look at North Korea, mm. just keep their head down, yes. follow the rules, write the reports on their friends, you know, acquaintances, relatives sometimes, mm. to survive. Yes. Um, and therefore, it becomes very difficult for anybody who, who, who feels that they need to see change in that country. Yes. We saw what happened to the poor Masa Amini in, in, mm. in Iran. Um, uh, it, it is a terrible place to exist. And your father, mm -hmm. um, you paint a compelling picture of him and your mother, both very strong characters, alive to this day. Yes. Um, uh, your father was compelled to flee. He was a successful businessman. Uh, your family were uh, upper middle class and, and came from a, a, you know, a well-connected set of uh, Kurdish and um, uh, Iraqi families. Um, so it was a comfortable lifestyle, notwithstanding the tyranny, mm -hmm. but then suddenly, it was upended. Can you tell us a little bit about why yeah. he had to leave hmm. and how, what the circumstances were? Absolutely. So, um, a, my mother's uh, sister's husband's relative, a, a young hmm. man, wanted a job. Um, they came to my father to ask whether he would employ him. My father made the mistake of giving this man a, a, a job in his business. Um, he then... Um, decided to blackmail my father, mm. uh, at which point um, 
although my father let him go, but he was sort of forgiving enough to bring yes. him back. He wrote a report to the um, uh, Secret Service saying uh, that uh, my father, Harris Sahawi, is a British agent. Now, the good... The, the so he was betrayed by a relative Correct. whom he'd already forgiven. Correct. Exactly right. Um, so uh, the, the bit of luck was that um, my aunt's husband, who had been the man who had you know, pleaded for this young man to have a job and, and to be brought back, uh, got news, because he was well-connected in the birth party, that that report has made its way th through the system, and they were coming to get my father uh, the next day. And we were at lunch at their home, and I remember this. So 24 day. hours Correct, to before. escape. Um, uh, the uh, bit of good news for my father is, is that because of his business, he had a re-entry visa to the United Kingdom. Uh, and uh, he very quickly, we, we left abruptly from lunch, went home, uh, he packed, he wrote a message on, on the wall of our home, um, which I talk about in the book. Uh, and then rather than um, taking the, what would have been you know, one route out, which is Iraqi Airways, mm. um, he booked on the Swiss Air flight and told his wonderful uh, uh, secretary at the time, who would have gotten into deep trouble, uh, that uh, uh, if anyone asks, he was driving up north mm. to a site that he had, business uh, that he had in Mosul, uh, as the sort of decoy. Yes. And then the next morning we set out to the airport, um, and um, he uh, boarded the Swiss Air flight. In those days, um, Baghdad International Airport had a, as a sort of viewing platform mm. where you can stand and watch the planes. There were no, you know, none of these sophisticated sort of um, uh, uh, arms that come out to planes. It was the old um, uh, step ladder that you go up. Exactly. Uh, not strolling, step, uh, strolling, strolling along strolling the tarmac. Along, along the tarmac. In the hot Exactly sun. right. Um, he boarded and, again, every, everyone's watching each other in the mm. airport, by the way, and you have to sort of almost pretend that this is a, a wonderful, happy, happy moment yes. of saying goodbye to a relative who's going on holiday. Um, uh, and my mother and myself and my sister stood uh, whilst the plane was still um, on the tarmac and a truck full of soldiers uh, sped up to the plane. Uh, they went up the, 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 uh, the steps. We were convinced they were gonna bring my father yes. off the plane and they, they didn't. They came out uh, uh, without him and um, Luckily, the, 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 the flight took off. And part of the reason why he chose, actually, Swiss Air is um, someone else who was trying to flee the country we'd heard about was on an Iraq Airways flight, which actually took off, but they brought it back down when they realized he was on it and they oh, arrested right. him. And um, that was a pretty miserable outcome for, for, for that particular family. Uh, and so that was the life mm. um, uh, that we lived. And then, of course, the next day, as an 11-year-old boy, I had to go back to school. Mm. And, of course... Um, Baghdad was a pretty small society, uh, and very few of uh, the children who I thought were friends of mine at school would speak to me. Yes. Uh, one remained a, a true loyal friend, and I talk about mm. them in the book, um, but you get all sorts of... You know, children can be incredibly cruel, as they were in England, by the way, in the, in the yes. early days of, of education. Uh, but you get all sorts of things, people coming up to you saying, your father's going to be brought back by Interpol, mm. he's a criminal, mm. he'll be hanged publicly. Yep. Uh, so it was pretty miserable, uh, that, that period of my life. And then, your father having made this daring escape, he was able to bring you, your mother and your sister over to England. Yeah. Um, this was in 78, 79. That's right. Um, and so you arrive here as an 11, 12 year old. Yeah. Uh, and you don't speak a word of English. Yeah. Uh, your father uh, has had the business that was based in Iraq effectively stolen from him. Yeah. So you're not quite penniless, but uh, the life of comfort that you'd led yeah. has disappeared. What did it feel like to be that little boy here in England with the comforts of home having snatched from yeah. you? Um, pretty miserable, cold, and you ask yourself the question, when you're 11, I've got a 12-year-old now, uh, mm. uh, uh, Mia, you, you begin to form you know, deep relationships, you know, emotional relationships with, with friends. So I, you know, the first question in my head is, is, I understood what had happened, mm. but why was it happening to us? You know, why did I have to leave you know, all those you know, friends behind? Um, and 
my early sort of recollection of, of, of school, again, uh, my parents didn't know much about the education system in the, in the UK, so they initially enrolled me at Holland Park uh, Comprehensive, uh, which wasn't as good as it was uh, under your stewardship. Or indeed uh, yours, Michael, as education Michael. secretary. Um, but, but uh, uh, you know, I, I would sit in the back of the class and try and string sort of the words together in my head to try and make mm. a sentence. Uh, the f very few words that, that I'd picked up, because again, children can be cruel. I didn't want to make a mistake. Um, but by the time I'd made the sentence in my head, the subject matter had moved on in the classroom, and they thought I had learning yes. difficulties. And then, mm. of course, you, know, you, you go out at, at lunchtime or break time, and you know, three much bigger kids mm. decide that they're going to sort of you know, uh, bait you and, and, and chase you around Holland Park and then dunk you head first into the, into the pond, see how long you can last underwater. Uh, that was pretty miserable when you can't really sort of answer back or you don't really know who to turn to. One of the uh, lovely things about the book is that it's often the case, of course, that political memoirs are used to sort of varnish someone's reputation. So you would expect if someone was explaining how they learned English, they would say, well, uh, it was the wonderful work of Dickens <laughs> that entranced my young mind. Yeah. Or I came across Keats's poetry and suddenly it all made sense. In your case, you explain that it was Dear Deirdre's case book. That's right. In the sun. Absolutely right. For those of you unfamiliar, Deirdre, uh, I imagine there are very few sun readers here in Cliff. Deirdre was the agony aunt in the sun. And what made Dear Deirdre's case book so compelling is that the problems that she was dealing with were not those of poor well-being. Uh, they were generally bedroom-related. Yes. <laughs> and for those with poor English, uh, there was a very helpful photo narrative account. <laughs> Absolutely right. <laughs> alongside. And you also confess that the other attraction of the sun uh, was Linda Lusardi. It's true. It's true. Knowing laughter from Lord Roberts of Belgravia there. <laughs> Linda Lusardi was not a political correspondent. She was the page three model. So, it's again, that, that, um, Nadim, you, you were yeah. a bit of a lad, weren't I, you? I had to make a choice when I wrote this book as to whether, yes. as you say, mm. I, I, I sort of varnish um, yes. or tell the truth. Um, and I chose the truth. And uh, I tried the Telegraph and, and other broadsheets, yep. uh, impossible to read mm. uh, for a sort of, you know, 13, 14-year-old boy. Um, uh, that, you know, his English wasn't really up to uh, mm. uh, much. Um, and that's when I discovered the Red Tops mm. uh, and the Sun. Um, and as you say, uh, the, the, the Deirdre column. But it, it, uh, I was a bit of a lad. And mm. um, uh, yeah. I talk about you know, some of the... Um, football hooliganism and uh, yeah. being um, exposed to the excitement and the sort of the adrenaline mm. of um, that uh, tribal um, uh, nature. But then an incident at the uh, uh, Liverpool uh, Southampton mm. uh, semi-final, which was mm. played at, at uh, White, Hart Lane, White Hart Lane, uh, made me very quickly realise that this is not a great path to no. tread. Well, again, one of the things that's revealing here is that um, we now know that Rupert Murdoch played a key role in the education of uh, young men <laughs> in the early 80s, <laughs> under underappreciated part of his heroism. But also, you were, uh, as you say, drawn into football uh, hooligans, just on the, on the, uh, the edges of it. Yeah. Um, and your friend at, uh, at school, yeah. friends at school, were, were not the studious types. They were the hard-drinking, yeah. underage, in the pub, right. uh, leery lads and so on. Um, and you also worked for a period um, uh, in a hospital, uh, a, a, effectively as a, as a porter, as an orderly, and That's so right. on. So uh, people looking at you now, highly successful businessman, highly successful politician, uh, you were, in your youth, reading quite a rackety life yes. in that sense. One of the things that may link them is you come across as someone who was always a risk taker, someone who always had that extra shot of adrenaline driving them forward. Do you think there is a link? Do you think that the, the young boy that you were, drawn to some of these riskier activities, and the adult politician, who inevitably has to take gambles, mm. is there a continuity there? Or is that the, the type of bogus linkage no, that not, journalists like to draw? I, I, a couple of things. Um, one, uh, one of the things I try and do with the book, um, and we'll get on to the sort of political stuff, is mm, sort of mm. demystify some of the politics, that there are no superhumans 
in any walk of life, mm. let alone in politics. And I think it's worth us just pausing and thinking about that because I really do feel that our politics is moving to a, a very dangerous place, very fragile, you know, the fragility mm. of, of the whole system that we've created, which is so important. You know, mm. When you come from a country where there is no democracy, yes. we really have to think about and protect our democracy. Um, and I'll just sort of return to that in, in a second. But you're absolutely right around um, risk and understanding risk. And I talk about my friend in the early days, who was probably the most talented boy at school, yes. who could have ended up doing amazing things with his life, mm. ended up absolutely destroying his life um, and you know, through drugs and um, other difficulties. Uh, and that's that sort of this, those sliding doors I was so close to. Yes. You know, I could have so easily, for example, in Iraq, my first cousin ended up on the front line in the Iraq-Iran war, got taken prisoner of war by the Iranians. Um, they wouldn't register him, so the, you know, the Red Crescent couldn't find him. Uh, destroyed his life, you know, even when he came back mm. after 12 years of not knowing uh, where he is to a, a young wife and two sort of teenage children that he'd left behind. That could have so easily been me. Uh, and actually, when I reflect on all those things, including the risks I took um, uh, as a sort of young lad in mm. England, uh, growing up in England, the one thing I do say to my team in which, whichever department I um, uh, was uh, in is we've got to get comfortable holding risk. Yes. You know, I banned the sort of the, 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 uh, the sentence that civil service would, would deliver to me. Minister, you know, we're, we're just... Uh, protecting you mm. um, uh, uh, from uh, uh, this particular issue, or, or we're de-risking it yes. for you. There is no such thing, mm. in my view. Mm. You've got to get comfortable holding risk, as we did. You'll remember mm. um, on the um, a ventilator challenge. Oh yes, you know, there was no. We, mm. we had no time. No. We couldn't afford to go out to, to a sort of competitive tender and everything else. We had to listen to the to the experts and to Dick Elsie and talk about it mm. in the book, and so. One of the things I think businessmen do it, men and women do it all the time. You, you, you analyze what evidence you have before you, you think of what is material to the decision they're going to make, and then you get comfortable holding risk. And I think that's the, that is absolutely the link, which I think, I hope, mm. led to some of the successes I had in, in government. Absolutely. And we will come to those in, in just a second. But I wanted to ask you about another risk taker in politics, Geoffrey Archer. Yes. Um, you worked with Lord Archer um, on the Simple Truth campaign, which was a, a very successful effort to raise money for uh, the uh, Kurdish people in uh, a, the aftermath of the first Gulf War. Um, and you also played a role in his ultimately ill-fated mayoral campaign. Now, opinion divides on Lord Archer, um, but you paint a very, I think, a powerful picture of someone with profound flaws, but also with significant virtues as well. Um, uh, if you were trying to convince someone of Lord Archer's virtues, what would you say were chief among them? And which of his flaws do you think uh, it's best to acknowledge in fairness as well? No, uh, absolutely. I, uh, again, back to what I was saying earlier about choosing to be brutally honest about my own life yes. and my own decisions in this book. Um, I did the same with Jeffrey, and I had to have a sort of conversation with him to say, like, I'm, going, I'm going to write this stuff. Mm. Uh, and actually, to his credit, he was comfortable... Um, uh, with it. I think his greatest strength is you know, if he were a football scout, he would have built a great team. Yes. And he found you know, these incredible young people. Um, none of us actually mm. thought we'd ever make it into uh, uh, you know, frontline politics, but mm. he made us believe yes. that we could. And around that table in those days was Sajid Javid, yes. Priti Patel, uh, Tobias Selwood, um, uh, Quasi quantity. Quasi. Mm. Um, uh, myself. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, lots of incredible uh, young men and women who ended mm. up in uh, parliament, in cabinet, and in, in, in government. And he literally would, would um, on his travels, yes. have a sort of a, a, an incredible sense for who, who he thinks could make it. Yeah. Uh, and then um, uh, you know, help facilitate some, some of the sort of, you know, uh, ways to, to, to yeah. uh, succeed. 
I mean, what, one of the things that comes across yeah. is that um, there is an element in which Geoffrey Archer is, in both the best and the worst sense of the word, a dreamer. Mm. So he was ahead of his time in recognising how the Conservative Party had to modernise, how it had to change, how it had to become more inclusive. Mm. He was someone without a prejudiced bone in his body, mm. who was a genuine meritocrat, and who uh, revelled in the success of others. Mm. He was not an egotist in, in, in that sense, not selfish in that sense, but also a dreamer in that he invented a story about himself and what he was doing, which meant that some of the uh, inconvenient details, like the Monica Coughlin episode to which you allude, he almost can't quite believe that that really happened to him. Yeah. So he both... Uh, I think you're right. I mean, I, I think yeah, part of being a great storyteller... Yes. Um, yeah, probably one of the best mm. um, uh, of his generation uh, for a particular type of book. Um, he would... He would Mm. Um, embellish, overlook, you know, particular aspects of his own mm. private life, um, and I think that's his great weakness. When you ask me what you know, yeah. strength and weaknesses, that would be the weakness. We'll go over to the audience sh shortly, but um, again, it may seem odd to pack into the final uh, five minutes before we go to the audience your political career because you're best known as a politician. But one of the reasons why I wanted to touch on the other matter is because so much that's good in this book is about your life before and around politics. But if people think of your political career, I'm sure that people will remember the key role that you played in uh, uh, the vaccine rollout. It wouldn't have happened without you, the fastest rollout in the developed world. People will also know that you were uh, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, the, the man in the nerve centre of the Cabinet Office at the time of the Queen's passing. Um, and they will also know that you played um, a role in the careers of every Conservative Prime Minister between 2010 and <laughs> 2024. Uh, there are very few people who served them all um, in, in different capacities. So of those three things, vaccines, yeah. the Queen's passing, and the qualities of the Prime Ministers that you worked with, can you say just a little bit about each? A little bit about uh, the vaccine rollout, yeah. a little bit about the, those momentous days in the aftermath of the Queen's demise, and also a little bit about the ratings that you would give those prime ministers. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, vaccine rollout. So um, you will know. So I was uh, the junior minister in the uh, Bays, in the business, business, energy and industrial strategy department, mm. uh, where we had um, responsibility for the brilliant Kate Bingham and what she was doing to actually um, effectively decide which teams were going to make the, the, our bet on to source the best vaccines possible. Um, and then I get the phone call uh, from the Prime Minister, from Boris, uh, where he says, um, your country needs you. You are going to be my beaver brook. Mm. Um, uh, you will be in charge of deploying this vaccine mm. as it comes through. Um, and I say... Yeah, he called me that too as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, not surprised. <laughs> but um, uh, I then pause and say... Of course, it would be a, 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 you know, a, a privilege to, to serve uh, my country. I said, on one condition, Boris. Uh, and I, he said, what's that? I said, I need to be able um, to speak with your authority. And he said, what does that mean? And I said, it means I, ha I have to have access to you hmm. in minutes, not in hours or days, because we're going to do something that has never been done before. And I can't wait. Hmm. For, me to, for those decisions to take place. And I think that was actually one of his real strengths is he, when he focuses, yep. he really does deliver. Yes. Um, and so uh, the real, if you ask me what I did on, on vaccine deployment, it was really to go in, um, kick the tires. We had an amazing team under Emily Lawson, you mm. know this. Yes. Um, uh, and of course, Ruth Todd on the other side, um, the, the unsung heroes of the uh, vaccine uh, production and deployment were the people who were in uh, you know, Ruth. We, we we pinched from the Minister of Defence. She used to be in charge of the most sensitive um, uh, nuclear submarine uh, 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 manufacturing and deployment, uh, and she came in to run the relationship with all the vaccine manufacturers. I tell you, she scared the living daylights out of them. Mm. They could not be less yes. by hours. Anyway, um, the the real success of the of the vaccine rollout is the ability to shed our differences, uh, whether internally or beyond um, uh, num you know, Whitehall. Uh, we worked with the Scottish government, the, you know this because you're mm. part of it, with the Welsh uh, government, um, 
mm. with Sadiq Khan and, and Andy Burnham and Andy Street. Mm. Uh, and um, that was really the remarkable thing that I, that I sometimes you know, worry that we, we don't replicate some of this stuff that actually the nation wants us to do. Um, but that was, I think, one of the, probably the, the most incredible teams that I've worked with. And there are incredible people in yes. the civil service. You know, this idea that the civil service is full of sort of layabouts is just not true. It's just how you try and harness and get the best out of people by being very clear on what your strategy is and what you're going to deliver against. Yeah. And, and I, mean, I saw uh, uh, during that period uh, Nadim in operation and uh, uh, the gifts that Nadim had in his business career, uh, focus, team building, uh, a capacity to drill down to the really significant detail to remove the obstacles in the way of others, and also salesmanship persuading some people who were vaccine hesitant that this would save their lives. They were all exhibited there. Yeah. Um, um, the funeral. Yes. I, I, in many ways, that, that is probably the, the, the greatest mm. achievement that I hope will be. As one of my friends texted me saying, I now know what the first line of your obituary will be. The second will be vaccine. Yes. yes. Um, uh, but that was, again, a mm. remarkable team uh, mm. that came together. You know, with, you know, of course, they, you know this. Uh, they practice... Uh, what is referred to as Operation London Bridge. Um, but until um, you are fully operational, you don't really know if you, every lever you're going to pull mm. uh, will operate. And it is, uh, it was rem it's like organising the Olympic Games in 11 days. Yes. We had 250,000 people in Hyde Park, 250,000 queued up for 14 hours or more uh, to pay their last respects uh, to Her Late Majesty when she lay in state. Thousands lined the streets. We had the greatest gathering at short notice of world leaders, um, prime ministers, presidents, monarchs, um, uh, ever in the history of the world. And all that had to happen in 11 days with mm. all the, the security considerations and everything else that we had to. And then we had to get all the world leaders to the UN because it was the UN General Assembly mm. at uh, the, the end of the week. Um, so uh, a remarkable uh, team effort again. and. Uh, I have to say, um, credit to Liz Truss is she allowed me and the team uh, to run this uh, mm. seamlessly. In terms of, uh, and I say something in the book, I was never close to Dave and George, mm. and so I always felt that I couldn't break into that clean. No, 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 no. You were much close to them, and, mm. I, 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 and I, that, that is sort of not... In, so, I, I was going to say, I'm, I'm going to cheat slightly. Go on. I'm very unfairly. Um, uh, Matt... Chorley, yes. when he conducts exit interviews with MPs like yes. us who've left, uh, asks people to sum up prime ministers in a word or at most a phrase. So I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to include George in this as well, <laughs> to sum them up. So a word or phrase for David Cameron. Word or phrase for David Cameron. Um, difficult to get to. Yeah. <laughs> word or phrase for George Osborne. Super bright. Um, can do with a little bit of emotional intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> Theresa May. Needs to learn to make decisions. Um, Liz Truss. Um, li has a blind spot when it comes to institutions. Institutions matter. Rishi Sunak. Super, super clever, doesn't value relationships. And, saving the best for last, discuss, Boris Johnson. The most consequential prime minister of his generation. Nadim, thank you so much. You've been as honest on stage as you are in this book. And now, it's over to the audience uh, to ask questions. And I'm going to begin uh, with our president, uh, Lord Roberts of Belgravia. Continuing in this uh, vein of, um, of honesty, uh, how would you sum up Michael Gove? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was a mistake. <laughs> uh, I've always find, found, my, we work obviously close together during the pandemic, um, incredibly professional. Um, but. but. <laughs> And you admitted this yeah. um, on, the, on the Omicron decision oh, yeah, yeah. that you got sucked into the whole you know, 
we have to be safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. have to lock down. Mm. Uh, and, I, and I think you know, that was a weakness mm. rather than a strength. Yep. Really... No, that, that is true. That is true. I can be uh, bullheaded, stubborn, and wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> often. Um, uh, yes, a young lady just there. Yes. I know, young lady. Um, I can't wait to read this book. Um, I speak, my name's Charlotte Eager. Michael actually sent me to Baghdad in 2004 and then resigned while I was there, which was quite annoying, but very interesting to be there. And I stood for um, the Conservatives in Liverpool at the last election. Given your background, I also work with refugees now, what do you think about the government's, not the government, sorry, the Conservative Party's current narrative of migration, and particularly irregular or legal migration, which is, of course, what your, your father was, an asylum seeker. Are you happy with this, or, or, or do you think perhaps there's something that we could learn that migrants are natural conservatives? So, Very good question. Great question. A um, couple of things on that. One, that I think migrant stock to this country would find it equally unfair that there are those who uh, jump the queue, um, yes, they put their lives at risk, of course, the, you know, the, the gangs are a terrible thing, but the illegal migration, the, the illegal boat crossings, offends every um, Brit, in my view, including you know, pe people from my community, uh, because it, 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 it goes against the sense of fairness, which I think is a value that's inherent in our country, and it also goes for, it, it poisons the well of goodwill, in my view. And that's the great danger of this, which is why I think, by the way, I, I genuinely believe that the next decade or two, the greatest challenge for Western democracy, uh, Europe, US, is going to be migration. If you go, you take Libya, anything south of Libya, there's half a billion people who are now much more mobile and are going to come under huge pressure, economic, social, political, environmental. Um, clearly, Europe cannot absorb half a billion people. Right? So we're going to need a... You know, much more grown up, a bit like the vaccine discussion where we come together. You know, I really quite like what, what um, uh, Rob Jenner was saying about Parliament debating this and agreeing quotas on what we need uh, to be able to both uh, bring in as immigrant um, uh, uh, immigration into our country, but also having safe and legal routes as we did for Afghanistan and Ukraine and, and Hong Kong. Uh, and so I think I worry about the way the debate is moving in this sort of polarized sense that if you speak about illegal crossings and want to stop them, then you must be a racist and you're attacking your own community. That's not true. Um, and then if, you, if, if, if you're sort of on the other side of that argument, then you must be for open borders and, and you know, a, 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 a world where the country gets um, uh, overwhelmed in terms of the number of people coming in and the public services get overwhelmed uh, by that. So I think we need almost a, a sort of vaccine moment because it brought down the Dutch government about six months ago, mm. right? And I think you, you see that this get, will, will become a genuinely the big issue of the next decade. Great. And yes, young man there. Uh, thank you for coming and telling your incredible story. Um, in comparison to other countries in Europe, like France and Italy, it, it's relatively easy to, for a young you know, immigrant boy, really, to, to integrate into British society. Do you think that there's, that's because of something unique about British culture or you know, Britain's place in history or the world in relation to Iraq, for example? Or do you think that, is there some other reason for that? Um. So I, I agree with you in terms of, I think in many ways, if, you look at, if I look at my own uh, life, uh, you know, the people of Stratford-on-Avon, a constituency that is 96, 97% white, affluent, middle class, farming community, people obviously always recognise it as the, uh, you know, the birthplace of William Shakespeare, but we, you know, it's a big rural seat. Uh, vote for someone called Nadim Zahawi, who was born in Baghdad, and every election I stood in, I increased my majority is a remarkable thing. I think it's much more remarkable, even in, in, 
uh, than in American politics, mm. where you sort of have to almost uh, gravitate towards your own community to, be, to stand a chance of being elected to Congress. Um, that's a wonderful thing. I think for the same reason, I touch on this in the book, that we've been able to sort of uh, keep you know, fascism out of our politics, whether it's the National Front when I was growing up or the BMP, is because we're an incredibly tolerant society. Uh, we are, you know, we, we, we like to feel that we've been fair in our life. And that sense of fairness, I was addressing the question earlier mm. about immigration, is the same. My, my, my worry is that people, the silent majority, right, are seeing things happen in the country where, where people are being intolerant, yet they're being tolerated if that makes sense, mm. right? And I think we need to tackle this sort of, we need to be intolerant of intolerance. Otherwise, you know, the social fabric will begin to be ripped apart and people will then feel actually, you know what, I don't want these type of people that may look like Nadim Zahawi. He might be a nice bloke, but, but the rest of his um, community may not be. Yeah. Becomes much more difficult. So I, th I genuinely think um, this country has had an incredible track record. Um, I'm nowhere wise enough or smart enough to tell you why. I think, yeah, of course, it must be you know, our history and um, our settlement. If you think about what we have been able to do so successfully is four nations right, have settled that we transfer wealth around the four nations so that we, we are you know, equally prosperous. Um, and that came through you know, our thousand-year story of you know, civil war and obviously war with mm -hmm. the Scots, but we've emotionally settled all of this stuff. Uh, in a much better way than I think um, some countries um, in Europe have done. Um, there's a gentleman there, um, and then we'll go to the uh, young lady in the uh, fourth row, fifth row back there. It's not a great moment uh, in the history of the Conservative Party today, and um, you're a risk taker and a, and a crisis manager to some degree. What uh, risks would you take today if you had full power to do so? Uh, to revive the party? Um, I, I think in many ways the most important thing um, is, and I've said this publicly, is, is unity. You know, we got to a stage in my party where uh, colleagues were going on um, television uh, proudly talking about the five families meeting at midnight in a smokeful room to settle their differences. And you sort of think, you know, what's the average Brit watching this thing where they're trying to meet their mortgage and their, you know, every other payment uh, that is putting them under pressure? Think of us. We're, we're meant to be the, 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 the government or the party of government and the natural party of government. Over the last 100 years, we've governed for 80% of that period. Um, and so I think in many ways, um, we, the nation was right to punish us and throw us out because it became ridiculous. Um, and I think the first thing, the first challenge... Uh, for any leader is to try and bring the party back together and to you know, put, figure out how we're going to try and unite um, to be able to then um, cut through. Otherwise, you're going to leave a, a void that more disciplined parties will begin to fill. Um, uh, and as I say, as this government comes under pressure because of, of migration, because of their, I think they're making a mistake on the economy, you know, to lose uh, more, and I know wealth is not the only proxy for talent, mm. but to lose more millionaires, yeah. uh, uh, second only to China, right? We really have a problem uh, uh, in terms of if we're really going to drive growth in this country. And so my view is uh, not just the leader, the whole parliamentary party has to work out that we're going to put our differences aside. You know, when you have the initials MP after your name, you're not a commentator, you're a participant. Um, and I think we lost some of that um, uh, uh, in the final uh, you know, years and months of the, the government. And the lady just there. Good afternoon. Oh, sorry, thank you. Hello. Your settlement history to me has been um, one from childhood to your professional career has been quite an astonishing, um, I would say, triumph over adversity to where you are today. Do you still keep links with your life before? from Baghdad, and how have you combined your cult the two cultures? Um, the young man behind mentioned about um, assimilating yourself into the British culture. How have you done that, and how do you help others who have been on the same path as yourself? Um, I do keep in touch 
Uh, and um, I have to say, when I shave my head in the morning looking at the mirror, I think I must be the luckiest man on earth um, to have ended up where I've ended up. And um, many of my friends have not had the same luck. They, their, their life has been blighted by 35 years of Saddam. And then post Saddam, I don't think we've really sort of managed Iraq so well, sadly. I think it was the right thing to, to remove it. I talk about that in the book. Um, but in terms of, um, I just think there are so many great things about our country. The best thing I can do is, one, teach my children that. Two, find young people that I can help. You know, I try and help as many young people, to, because you know, what does it take to send an email or pick up a phone and help someone? Um, and, and then they, they, they're, they're set on a path that hopefully uh, will end up where I am. The best person I try to help, I've got two, two seconds, is in the Department of Education, where we had a program um, where we brought, looked after children, so children that we had to take away from their biological parents, into the civil service. And one day, I hope, one day, one of those will end up running the whole civil service, because that's how you make institutions more human. Nadim, thank you so much. We're, we're, we are out of time. However, um, one thing I didn't mention, Nadim also set up Britain's most successful polling organization, YouGov. Um, and therefore, I'm going to ask Nadim, as a pollster, and pollsters always get things right, three things. <laughs> Who will win the American presidential election? <laughs> Who will win the conservative leadership race? And what is the percentage chance of Keir Starmer still being prime minister in four years' time? <laughs> um, thank you, Michael. So on the US elections, I think that Kamala's done an incredible job yes. um, of um, uniting her party and delivering you know, quite a you know, smart message. Um, I suspect that um, the sort of the, the, the shy Tory factor yep. will apply. There'll be lots of people who won't tell their husbands, wives, relatives that they're voting for Donald Trump, uh, but it's the economy stupid. Mm. And I think he still leads on the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it'll be a very tight race, but I think he'll, he'll uh, just make it. Um, I think uh, we've got some very fine candidates for leadership of our party. Four uh, brilliant candidates. I am at the moment a foot soldier. I will decide at party conference and okay. I will come out uh, in favour of, of, I hope, uh, one of our brilliant candidates. Yep. Um, I think Keir, if he's not careful, will be a, a, a one-term yep. prime minister. I have no, I've not really seen, I saw something the other day about um, governments falling below 30% popularity and how long it took them. Tony Blair took over a thousand days. Keir's taken 70 days. It is extraordinary, the fall um, at the moment, uh, and, and the, just the, the, the speed of the decline. Um, I genuinely felt, I thought that they will put pressure on us from the right. I thought they will very you know, quietly get Rwanda operational and demonstrate that that, uh, that sort of prevention begins to work. And we saw it when we had the vote at midnight, mm. um, that you saw people yep. going back into Ireland, the Republic of Ireland through Northern Ireland, because they were worried they're going to be uh, um, uh, processed in Rwanda. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I, I think if he's not careful, he's a one-term, which is why actually the party needs to, to, to uh, elect a leader that can be prime minister. Close your eyes and think who can stand opposite Keir Starmer and look credible to the nation as prime minister. That would be the candidate to go for. Well, Nadim, thank you so much for being so honest with us. I can't recommend this book highly enough. In particular, I hope everyone here buys it and enjoys the story of the hairdryer, the multicolored t-shirts, and take that. <laughs> it's true. I won't say any more other than to thank Nadim Zahabi. The book is available in John Tando's bookshop now.